another episode of the Young Terps podcast. Ahmed Kafir and Mason Viner. We're talking Terps, Charlotte on Saturday. The Terps getting the bright lights, 730 on NBC. And of course, at CQ Stadium, where hopefully we'll see some parts of the Terps new game day experience. Ahmed, uh, Charlotte, a lot of familiar faces and some bad blood with Maryland. <laughs> yeah, I definitely expect it to be a... Uh... Uh, a chippy, chippy game uh, on Saturday. Obviously, I believe it's six former Terps, uh, Austin Fontaine, uh, Ja'Kai Green, Zion Shockley, uh, T.J. Butler, uh, Isaiah Hazel. Uh, all those guys are now with Charlotte, Mike Miller, J- uh, Jerry Prutos. Uh, but those guys were obviously uh, coaches, analysts last year uh, who are now with the Charlotte program. And then uh, uh, St. Francis is a defensive line coach, is also a uh, D-line coach over at Charlotte as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of familiarity. You know, Locks, we talked about it today. It's just, you know, uh, the the added layer that uh, Mike Locksley's son, Kai, uh, played under Biff uh, at Gilman back in the day. So um, definitely, definitely will be some, some familiar faces. I'll be cu- curious to see uh, what the vibe is like after the game. Yeah, Charlotte started off the season uh, at home, a 24-3 win over South Carolina State, who's n- not really a great FCS program. And really, I think we'll see a lot of uh, ground game going up against Maryland and maybe an early test for the defensive line. Not really sure if you can call it a test when you're a 24-point favorite, but Terps certainly going to see Charlotte running the football a lot. Yeah, I think uh, I think kind of what's interesting, kind of coming off the heels of Towson, and, you know, Loxie talked about it, you know, Maryland was kind of able to uh, – you know, find some pressure on the edge, but the, the level uh, pressure was kind of a level blitzing was kind of something, an, an area of focus kind of going into week two. And um, you saw Maryland, you know, the, against Towson, uh, the bulk of the Tigers rushing guards, uh, like Loxy said, came against, you know, QB scrambles, things like that. So uh, I think this weekend, obviously, I think uh, on paper, I think Maryland's just sheer depth. I think that's what's going to be able to uh, really outlast Charlotte over a 60 minute span. Uh, but when you think about Jalon Jones, uh, what he's able to do in the pocket there with that dual threat meant to, uh, uh, threat there, um, you know, he poses uh, a significant challenge to Maryland in that front seven. And obviously, you know, Charlotte's going to run the football. Uh, so they've got a couple of running backs, uh, Teron Kelman, uh, uh, Darrell Robinson, but those guys, uh, former St. Francis, uh, stars who both really efficient on the ground. So um, I do think that it'll be a test for the front seven, uh, just, you know, kind of gradual build up in the conference play. And I think uh, it'll be uh, a chance for them to, um, you know, for, be just as dominant as they were uh, against Towson. Yeah. The thing that jumps off the stat sheet from their game for me was just seeing the quarterback with 10 carries, 63 yards on the ground, obviously throws two interceptions in the game as well, but Maryland, just has struggled against running quarterbacks. You talk about the contain on the edge. That's something that Locks pointed out post game. Them lacking that ability, so it does give them a chance to take a step forward in that area. They're certainly going to see quarterbacks like to get out of the pocket uh, throughout the year. So it, it's a different look that they'll see. I'm sure you, if you didn't think you saw a lot from Maryland last weekend, I think we've seen just about nothing from Charlotte as far as what what their game looked like against South Carolina State. So Biff's certainly going to try and pull out all the tricks. You're going to get the team's best shot, and I think that. That in itself is valuable to Maryland going forward this year is they're truly going to get a team that's trying to make a splash, that's trying to make their way onto it with a guy that's coached so long in the state of Maryland that's going to want to recruit the state of Maryland. You're going to see Charlotte's best game uh, or as far as early season best game that you'll get out of them. And, and that that's just really, really valuable for a football team like Maryland to get challenged really, to get punched in the mouth and really see how they respond. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Like I said, you know, I expect it to kind of be a chippy game, obviously, just with the familiarity. And then, you know, just overall, just the the, the, the amount of deep people for, that came from the DMV that are really just going to be on the same field together. I think um, it'll be that, you know, just some, uh, um, you know, some in- interesting themes kind of throughout the day. But, um, yeah, like you said, you know, I think uh, what, what Jalon Jones is able to do with the read option, I think that'll kind of test it. Um, and then, you know, on the other side of the ball, I think, you know, Ayabi Anoma, uh, uh, Austin Fontaine, both those guys, um, you know, they've been able to show flashes in the past that, you know, they can make an impact in the trenches. Um, Maryland offensive line, you know, like we talked about, I think I uh, did a, a breakdown of the offensive line. I believe it was 13 offensive linemen that saw the field on Saturday. I uh, can't say that, you know, I expect to really see 13 uh, return to the field against Charlotte. I think it'll be a little more trim, maybe, you know, seven, eight, maybe Maryland, you know, continues to rotate if they're able to take care of business and, and jump out to a similar lead like they were against Towson. But, um, you know, I definitely think that there are some, especially, you know, like I said, obviously on both sides of the ball, I think that's where Maryland's kind of able to take those strides and that's kind of where Maryland maybe has the most to gain uh, out of this weekend. 
Yeah, you talk about the Terps. For me, I, I agree with you on that. Just getting rhythm, getting your guys together, and, and continuing to build on, on what the good pieces from the Towson game were last week uh, against a little bit better competition. For me, I mean, I'm looking at Maryland's passing game, keeping Leah off the ground, getting the ball out quick, continuing to do those things, and then really being able to take advantage of the deep ball, something we talked about in our post-game pod where those couple of drops, couple of off-time plays where it really looked like they had an opportunity. Can they get – just that a little bit better, or in Loxley's case, I think he's looking for them to get a lot better, say, given that he said their biggest jump should be between game one and game two, or always is between game one and game two. For me, I'm looking for the little things. Do they pick up those edge rushers, the running backs, a little bit more involved in the blocking game? When I went back and watched the tape, I really didn't like what I saw on their chips. The tight ends weren't very involved in any sort of pass pro. Can they kind of sharpen the pencil just that little bit much to – to be able to put up those points that I think you expect to see. And given that they're out between a 23 and a half and 24 and a half point favorite, certainly Vegas thinks they're going to be able to put up some numbers in this game. Hopefully it's a good show uh, in college park on Saturday night. Yeah, I, I believe it was, uh, you know, Maryland, they, they struggled with drops. Uh, I believe it was uh, uh, seven drops, three throwaways. I believe that's what Loxie said. Um, I believe he finished 22 of 33, though, so can't remember what the 11th uh, incompletion was attributed to. But, yeah, you know, like you said, you know, uh, the drops, a lot of those came 15, 20 yards downfield. I think uh, the, the one everyone will remember is the one, the deep ball for Ty Felton. Uh, and I think, you know, he's a guy that he's been able to show flashes through the years. You know, uh, I think that was kind of a chance for, you know, his first chance to, to you know, kind of make that splash play. So um, I think those are those are kind of the things that, like you said, Merrill wants to be able to take that next step with. Um, and then, you know, Loxie talked about it today. And uh, I think it's kind of, you know, goes back to the offensive line, but just the interior protection. Uh, and I think that kind of just, like I said, just goes back to, you know, we saw Corey Bullock uh, playing center, um, uh, Mike Purcell, Eric Harris, both those guys were we're alternating. Uh, Mike Purcell was the first two series, and Eric Harris. Uh, and then Purcell came for the last series of the first half, and then Eric Harris rotated back in uh, uh, midway through that series. So you saw a lot of that on Saturday. So I think just kind of with that unit kind of being able to gel together a little bit, uh, and I expect to maybe see a little bit more uh, cohesion uh, up front a little to, to, to try and generate that chemistry going into Virginia uh, next Friday night. But um, I, I think that that's kind of where I want to see as well. Um, and then defensively, you know, I think just, just being able to kind of contain that read option quarterback uh, and, and maybe limit those big plays on the ground. I think that's, um, you know, what Merrill needs to be able to do. I think if they're, as long as they're able to kind of keep everything in front of them uh, and kind of keep the, the Charlotte offense a little bit more horizontal, uh, I think that'll, that'll definitely bode well for Merrill chances on Saturday. Yeah, I'm just going off of that point. I would like to see the receiver rotation cut down maybe a little bit more. Just if we're going to stack, if we're going to play that many guys at receiver, let them get out one or two series in a row. And, of course, you can sub during situationally, but really let guys start to get some rhythm to them. I feel like a guy like Ty Felton will benefit from that. I think Octavian Smith, just some of those younger guys that really haven't gotten on the field a ton in a row that have always been situational pieces that you're really expecting to contribute a lot. Let them get touches. Let them get warmed up and into playing against somebody else. That's what everybody always says. I can't wait to, you know, get on the field and see some competition. Well, let them start to get some snaps and stack those. If you're only going to give them 20 snaps, let's let it be 15 in a row and then five around the game. You know, let, let's start to see that. I think that goes for the offensive lineman. You mentioned that center rotation. When, when you hear successful quarterbacks talk, they always talk about their centers. I think we have a successful quarterback, and I think we need to give them a center that's going to be out on the field all the time with him. I think that that's just something that a lot of people that know football will tell you, you have to get that exchange down. We don't want to end up in spots like we've seen the last couple of seasons where they haven't had a strong player at the position. And suddenly we're in November and the ball's getting snapped over the quarterback's head. Cause it's the guy's first snap of the game midway through the second quarter. Um, it, it's just, again, the little things that are out there and the defensively, you mentioned the read option quarterback. I'll, spin it around to the defensive side of that, not over pursuing the quarterback, keeping contain on the outside, getting those guys in there at edge. And man, if there's a game, if you looked at what Donnell Brown did in the, in that second half when yeah. he really got in there, I'm going to love watching him play on Saturday night because this is the perfect offense for him to really come onto the scene against, get off the edge, pin down and, and use his frame and his skill set is perfect to stop a read option quarterback. And, and man, I think Maryland really has a gem in him. If he can, if he can get it going. 
Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I thought, you know, Mike Harris was another guy, he, you know, in his first career action uh, as a Terp, I thought he was another guy that looked really good in the second half as well. And his, uh, I believe he finished with uh, 15 snaps, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, like you said, you know, just kind of being able to um, stay disciplined and stay within your assignment. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, just from a, from a, you know, another perspective, I think from, we've heard a lot about, you know, through this off season, you know, how the, the locker room has developed, how, you know, the, the chemistry and, you know, the, the player led culture, you know, it, it's there. And I think a lot of fans, you know, I've said it before, but I think a lot of fans maybe overlook that stuff and they think maybe it's just coach speak, but I think a lot of that kind of is attributed to just the, the culture and the, the improved culture, I should actually clarify um, that you've continued to see from year one to year three to now. Um, but I think a big part of that is kind of staying disciplined. And I think, like we said, you know, I expect to see some uh, chippiness, uh, you know, wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we see some, uh, some blocks, finished well past the, the, the whistle. So um, I think Maryland being able to stay composed and, you know, I think we've seen strides over the last year, uh, last, excuse me, last season. Uh, and obviously this past week as well, Maryland did a really good job of penalties uh, against Towson. Um, but just like keeping, keeping the composure, I think that'll kind of be another, another aspect to, to, for, for Maryland fans uh, to really see what, what kind of team it is. Yeah, could not agree more. I think that if you looked at what shot Maryland in the foot the most, if that's the phrase you want to use for it, last year it had to be those penalties at just really, really poor times in games. This is going to be a team that, yeah, it's going to get up in your face. They're going to try and do everything you can to knock you off your game. I think going coming out of that locker room, Charlotte knows that talent-wise, they don't stack up well in this game. So it's can you get in Maryland's head, can you knock Maryland off their game and then make a couple big plays early to give yourself a chance into the late second quarter or into halftime where you know – that you can almost make the other team scared. That's how a lot of teams at that level, when they're trying to make that big splash, do it. They come out, they get you off your game early, they put up a couple of points, and suddenly before you know it, it's 14-3, and, and you're in a position to make a mistake that can really put you behind in the game. Uh, Ahmed, looking at something that a lot of Terp fans are concerned about, what does the injury report look like for this week? Who, who's in and who's out at practice today? Yeah, uh, got a yet Z. That was a good sign to see. Um, we hadn't seen in the last couple – Open portions of practice. Obviously, he missed uh, the season opener, but uh, he was out there today at practice. Um, so that was obviously good to see. Talia Tiger by Loa, uh, he was back at practice, uh, and I think that was a really kind of interesting injury because I think from the from the press box, uh, a lot of people saw him go into the medical tent, saw him come back out, uh, and then at that point, I think when he came out of the game officially, he was thirty five to six, three minutes up in the third quarter. Uh, so it didn't really seem like there was too much concern. He was. Yeah, a little post game didn't seem to be uh, injured too too much, but uh, I think with the uh, the broadcast crew, I think there was and just you know Leah looking looking like he had some injury in his left arm there or left hand maybe uh, looked like there might have been some concern, but uh, no concerns there. Talia said he felt great and Loxley, you know kind of talked about you know it's football, you know he took some hits, but uh, he was back at practice, you know no no real concerns there, and uh, I continue to hear that there was no concern regarding injury when he came out of the game on Saturday. So uh, I think that bodes well, but obviously, you know, him taking those hits, I think, especially when, when fans are kind of looking at the offensive line, uh, I think I think fans are just going to be mindful of, of how many times he goes down. But nonetheless, uh, going into week two, he looks good. Uh, and then Gavin Gibson, I saw him back at practice today. Uh, he was, he went down after the second scrimmage of fall camp. So uh, good, you know, maybe, maybe he, you know, is held out this upcoming weekend. Maybe he's listed as question. Well, wouldn't completely shock me, but uh, trending towards uh, being available uh, potentially week three, but uh, definitely by, by conference play. Yeah. So a lot of good news on the injury front for the Terps. Ahmed, I guess I got to ask you this question, Maryland uh, minus 23 and a half on Saturday. Are you laying the points and taking the Terps? Uh, man, I thought about this because uh, I think I saw it at minus – I think it opened at minus 25 and a half. And, I, again, I do think that Maryland talent-wise, I think that for over a 60-minute span, like I expect Maryland to go into halftime with a lead. Whether it's a three-point lead, I could see that. I could definitely see Charlotte uh, really unloading at the playbook. Like I said, you know, they, they, they're, they've been very confident. They've been pretty loud about it, and that hasn't really been a secret – uh, all off season. So I expect them to, to really leave it all out there. Um, I think, I think I'll take Maryland with the points, just so, like I said, over a 60 minute span, I think Maryland will be able to at least generate a, at least a three touchdown lead. Um, but I don't think that is a lock. So, uh, would be curious to see what the over is. I think a lot I saw 50 and a half. Um, 
I think I'd be more comfortable probably taking the over than, than maybe Merrill with the points. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I go back to last year, and, and Maryland won that game 56-21, to 21, and it was over pretty soon after it started. But yeah. the entire time while they won the game by that many scores, you never really felt like Maryland ever got it going. I, I kind of felt like that was a theme throughout all of last year. I would love for that to change on Saturday night. However, I, I love a team that's that's as feisty as Charlotte is coming into this, that, that's talking trash like they have been now for months, that, that has that relationship with players. I think this game will be personal for a lot of guys on the field on both sides, which I think will make it entertaining and definitely a watch-worthy game because the college football slate this Saturday is bad. It's it's ugly. Maryland Charlotte fits right in there with the primetime games that are on. So uh, I, I I would lean if I had to take Maryland with the points before I took Charlotte with the points or take Maryland laying the points before I took Charlotte with the points. But the over, I think, is the play. If you're into gambling, Maryland's certainly going to put up some numbers. I wouldn't count Charlotte out to get to that 21 or 28 point mark in this game. And you know, there's a reason why they play the game, and that's because trash talk doesn't win on the field. And I think the Terps are definitely walking away with the win. Yeah, like I said, uh, and I, I completely agree with that. I, I think, um, I think Jalen Jones. I mean, like like we said, you know, they they, they did a good job just kind of keeping it vanilla. Um, he finished 13 of 19 for 125 yards. Did throw a pair of picks uh, against one touchdown, but um, you know, they they have a lot of running backs that they can kind of lean on. And like I, like we said, you know, I think that there's. Maryland's defense will get tested. They'll get some good looks. I mean, Darrell Robinson, uh, if you were on Inside the Black World, like I, I was really high on him. I saw flashes of him junior year, senior year. I thought he was really good. Um, so, I mean, they Maryland's going to face some talent this weekend. I think it's a, it's a good week, too, uh, going into UVA next Friday. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think I, I do expect Maryland to move to 2-0. Uh, and when all said and done, it'll be really interesting to see uh, what Biff's comments were after apparently he did not meet with the media this week. So uh, we shall see. Yeah, I think that post-game presser might be the one to go to after this. <laughs> He's definitely an entertaining guy. He he, yeah. he gets his brand out there. There's nothing nothing that challenges that. He has his brand, his followers, and and he does his thing, and we'll see if it's successful in the college football world. Yeah, I, I just have a feeling one way or the other we're going to get some, some golden quote. So uh, late Saturday night will be fun. Yeah, and speaking of late Saturday night, we'll be doing our post-game pod right after uh, Coach Loxie talks to the media. Again, make sure to check that out on Saturday. All the coverage on Inside the Black and Gold with Ahmed. And as always, if you like the show, give it a like, comment, review, wherever you consume the podcast. All that stuff helps us out. And as always, thanks for watching.